Good morning, High Point. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad that you're streaming with us right now. Hey, who remembers New Coke? Back in the mid-1980s, there was a Coca-Cola war, or a cola war that was going on. Coca-Cola was losing market share to Pepsi, and so Coke on April the 23rd, 1985, replaced the original formula with new Coke. And the country revolted. Millions of people made their voices heard. It only took 79 days for Coca-Cola original formula to work its way back onto store shelves released as Coca-Cola Classic on July the 11th, 1985. Coincidentally, in 1985, this movie was released, Back to the Future, and this was the same year that the Bears last won the Super Bowl. Just saying. So, the same year that the, the Bears haven't won a Super Bowl since, get this, since New Coke was in grocery stores and Back to the Future was in movie theaters. All this to say is that you can't replace, you can't add to the original. Whether it's Coca-Cola, whether it's Back to the Future, none of the sequels were better than the original, right? And you can't replace or add to the Super Bowl shuffle of the 85 Bears. Once you have tasted the real thing, nothing else satisfies. Once you've tasted Jesus, nothing else satisfies. For centuries, though, man-made religious systems have tried to replace and Add to Jesus, but Jesus is the real thing. Only Jesus saves, only Jesus sanctifies, only Jesus satisfies. So if you have a copy of God's word, whether physical or digital, whether here in person or online, open it up to Colossians chapter 2. We're in a series entitled First Things First, Embracing the Supremacy and Sufficiency of Jesus. We're marching our way through the book of Colossians this fall in this series. The title of this message is Choose Jesus Over Religion. Choose Jesus Over Religion. You see, back in the days in Colossi, they had a Jesus plus mentality. Anyone ever been to Mod Pizza? I love going to Mod Pizza because you don't just have to order off the menu. You build your own Mod. And I have built the world's greatest thin crust pizza at Mod Pizza. Here are my ingredients. Extra mozzarella, pepperoni, sliced tomatoes, jalapenos, pineapple, and corn. Throw it in the oven, cook it extra crispy, sprinkle on some of that uh, crushed red pepper. I'm telling you, it is amazing. How many of you would agree with me that that sounds amazing? How many of you think that sounds awful? Don't diss it until you try it. That's all I'm saying. But back in Colossae, they were building this religious kind of mod pizza where they had this false spirituality where they're putting in a mysticism and legalism and aestheticism. And that's not just alive back then. It's alive today because it's 
alive in our hearts. So here today, we're going to be talking about legalism, mysticism, aestheticism. We're going to have some fun in church. Anyone ready to have some fun in church today? So if you're taking notes, here it is. Three reasons to choose Jesus over religious systems. Here is reason number one. Reason number one is this, is choose Jesus over legalism because only Jesus saves. Well, where do we see this? We see it right here in verse 16. It says this, therefore, the word therefore is a connecting word. It connects it back to the previous verses. Pastor Ron was preaching last weekend in verse number eight. It talks about philosophy and human tradition. And now Paul's going to go into greater detail about that. So let no one pass judgment on you. Let no one be an umpire. Calling balls and strikes is what he's saying in relating to questions of food and drink or in regard to festivals or the new moon or the Sabbath. These words drip of legalism. In the church in Colossae, the legalism was focused on food and festivals. It was focused on special diets and special days. Is there anything wrong with special diets? Anyone like kale in the house today? Anyone like kale? More people like kale than my pizza? There's a problem here today. (laughs) Anybody vegetarian? Any vegans? There you go. You're raising your hand proud. Any bacon-loving carnivores out there? Yeah, there you go. So in the Old Testament, there were some laws about animals and what was clean and unclean. But Jesus in Mark chapter 7 verse 15, talking about that same topic. He said, it's not what's on the outside of the person that makes him unclean, but it's what comes out of him is what is unclean. Jesus always got to the heart, and that's what we want to get to today. We want to get to the heart. So there's nothing wrong with having a special diet. There's nothing wrong with special days here. It's talking about the Sabbath back then as it is today. Jews celebrate the Passover on Saturdays. Back then, as it is today, Christians gathered together for worship on Sundays. Have you ever wondered why we gather together for worship on Sundays? Sundays is the Lord's Day. Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So from centuries going all the way back to New Testament days, Christians have gathered together on Sundays. So here at High Point, we gather in the first hours of the first day of every week because God is worthy of our first in our best. So there's nothing wrong with special diets and special days. The problem is legalism. Well, what is legalism? Legalism is Jesus plus religious rules. Don't just think about skirts all the way down to the ankles or someone who only reads from the King James Version. Legalism can be a lot more subtle than that. Here's a definition for legalism. Jot this down. Legalism is measuring self and others by religious rules. Sometimes we think about legalism is is about adding rules. It's really not just about adding rules. Legalism is about measuring self and others based on religious, based on man-made rules. And so the legalists... They see rules as a ruler, as a measuring stick to see if they measure up. And if they measure up to their man-made regulations, they feel good about themselves. And not only do they feel good about themselves, oh, God must feel really good about me. God must be really impressed with me because I do even things that he doesn't ask me to do. It's kind of like getting extra credit. Anyone not like that kid in school that always did the extra credit? That's legalism. But it's not just measuring self, but it's measuring others. And if you don't measure up to my man-made requirements... then I pass judgment on you. I condemn you. I shun you. I ignore you. I gossip about you. And it's okay. I'm justified because you don't measure up. See how legalism is pride? 
It's a self-righteous pride that's in our hearts. And this is why Jesus was so against legalists back in his day. And he is today. Legalism is both dangerous and divisive. Why is it dangerous? It's dangerous because we have this false sense that we're doing okay because we think we measure up. It's divisive because it destroys unity in relationships and it hinders the gospel from going forth. But I've got some personal convictions about some things. That's okay. It's okay to have personal convictions about things. So long as you don't become a legalist about it and you start to measure yourself and you measure others as it relates to that. So let's get real practical. Can we talk about some hot topics here in church today? Anyone ready to be spicy in church today? Can we talk about some hot topics? Some topics that, if we're not careful, they can lead to legalism. So let's just think about this. How about what we wear? Our attire? What's appropriate? What's inappropriate? How about music? Positive encouraging. K-love all day, every day. Or Taylor Swift or Jelly Roll, not the donut at Dunkin'. <laughs> Alcohol. To drink or not to drink. Schooling. Public school, private school, Christian school, homeschooling. Halloween. Welcome to October. In a room this size here at High Point, there are different personal convictions as it relates to Halloween, and that is totally fine. So long as, paraphrasing verse 16, that we don't pass judgment on one another as it relates to questions about candy or not to candy, to dress up or not to dress up as it relates to the festival of Halloween. You see how I paraphrase verse 16? How about tattoos? To tat or not to tat? That is the question. Would it surprise you that in our family of five, I am the only one that does not have a tattoo? Camille has a tattoo. Our three kids have tattoos. Their, their uh, spouses, our two daughter-in-loves, lo have tattoos. So in our family of seven, I am the only one that does not have a tattoo. Should I get a tattoo? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, thumbs down. There you go. We'll see about that. <laughs> There's a lady who started attending High Point this past year who's all tatted up. Uh, but you wouldn't know because she wears long sleeves to church even on 90 degree days. Why? Because she doesn't want to be judged by Christians at church. Does that break your heart? Does that make you angry? Not like a little bit angry, but a lot angry that that could be in our church, High Point Church? Started attending Hope Group. This past week, she unzipped her hoodie and took it off. I was both glad and grieved. Glad because she has found a safe, shame-free, supportive space for her to be her honest self. But grieved that she doesn't experience that on Sunday mornings. See, legalism is hard to get out of a church. Why? Because legalism is in our hearts. Are you a part of the problem or are you part of the solution? I know I can struggle with legalism at times. I can judge people. How about you? Can't we do better? How many of you would agree we can do better as a church as it relates to this? So maybe you're here, maybe you're online. Just want you to know this. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter your past, no matter your present, that you are loved by God and you're loved by our church. And we're glad that you're here. We choose Jesus over legalism because only Jesus saves. Notice this in verse 17. It says this, that these are a shadow. Well, what is these? These are the food and festivals, the 
uh, special days and special diets. So these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Think about a shadow. There is no substance in a shadow. Ever try to hug a shadow? You can't hug a shadow. A shadow points back to a substance. So let's think about this, is that the shadow of food pointed back to the substance of Jesus, that he is the bread of life. That the festivals were shadows pointing back to the substance of Jesus, that he's the Passover lamb. That the substance of the Sabbath, or the shadow of the Sabbath, pointed back to the substance of Jesus, that we can find rest in Jesus. And so we choose Jesus over legalism. Why? Because only Jesus saves. Religion says, follow rules. Jesus says, follow me. Religion says, do. Jesus says, done. Religion says, pay penance, earn favor, try your hardest, achieve through rituals. Jesus says, it's not about what you do. It's about what I've done for you on the cross. Jesus says, I paid a penalty that I did not owe, that you owed and could not pay. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And it's not a good suggestion. It's not a good idea. It's not good advice. It's the good news. But the reality is we don't understand the good news unless we understand the bad news. And the bad news is as bad as it gets. So picture yourself right now out in the middle of an ocean. You're in the water. No lifeboat. No life preserver. You're going under. What is it that you need? You need the Coast Guard. You need someone to come and save you. You need a savior. And in the same way, we are drowning in the ocean of our own sin. And we can't save ourselves. We need a savior. The problem is religion Religion thinks, well, I'm doing pretty good. Religion deceives us into thinking we're not in the middle of the ocean, but we're on a sandy beach underneath some palm trees with a coconut drink in our hand and everything is okay. But that's not reality. Reality is that we're drowning in the ocean of our sin and we desperately need a savior, that religion says there are good people and there are bad people. Jesus says there are bad people who need grace. The truth is we are more sinful than what we think we are, but we're more loved than we think We are. And that's the paradox. And that is grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So what's grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You have been saved. You realize that you need to be saved. The religious person doesn't realize that he or she needs to be saved. For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. What's faith? Faith is putting your trust in Jesus. It's trusting in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for your forgiveness and your salvation. And notice this, and it's not your own doing. Being good isn't good enough, but it's a gift from God. And so if it's a gift from God, have you received this gift? Have you opened up this gift for yourself. It's not a result of your works, your effort, so that no one may boast. Being good isn't good enough. If it was, why did Jesus need to die? 
Going to church doesn't save you. Reading your Bible doesn't save you. Being good doesn't save you. Being baptized doesn't save you. Religion doesn't save you. You don't save you. Only Jesus saves. And only Jesus has the power to do that for you. So salvation is, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. That salvation is a gift, it's a gift that's given that we must receive. Again, have you received this gift of salvation? Have you admitted to God, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself and I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for me? You might think, well, I'm kind of like a Christian by default because I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Hindu, I'm not Muslim, so I'm a Christian. No, I'm asking you, can you point to a time where you turn from your sin and embrace Christ by faith for the forgiveness of your sins? For me, I was a teenager, 16 years old. For Pastor Ron, he was in his late 20s. What is your story? Can you point back to a time? Do you have assurance of your salvation? Well, what does that mean? Do you have certainty that Jesus is your savior? Do you have certainty that heaven is your eternal destination? If not, if not, today is the day. October the 6th, 2024, October. Today is the day of salvation for you that that, uh, grace and forgiveness is given to you freely. Grace and forgiveness is given to you in your mess, in your suffering, in your struggling, your inadequacies, your insecurities, your efforts to try to be better, in your guilt, in your shame. It's given to you freely. No one's disqualified. It's not like God is like, oh, I can't save that person. Oh, they're too far gone. Jesus' blood didn't pay for that. No, it's just the opposite. It's offered. But we need to admit that we need it and then receive it. Have you done that? before. If not, today could be the day. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm not certain. I'd encourage us just in the middle of this message, why don't we all just bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Maybe you're here and you have certainty of your faith. Praise God for that. Use this as a time to pray for other people. But maybe you walked into the room here today and you have questions and you're not certain and you want to have that certainty. You can just pray along with me. Just pray from your heart and in your mind. Just pray along with me. God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I can't believe that you would love me, but your word tells me that you love me. You love me enough that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And I believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. I choose to receive this life and forgiveness that you offer as best as I know how. And with your heads bowed and your eyes continue to be closed, I encourage you if you didn't have certainty and you want that certainty, if you prayed along with me, if you would just raise your hand. And by raising your hand here in this place, that doesn't mean that you're saved because you raise your hand. But what it does is it's an added step. It's like I just did something and I acknowledge that I did something and God's seeing this room and he sees your hands. Praise God for that. Father, we thank you for your work here in this place. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you that we don't have to try harder, but we can rest upon what he has done for us on the cross. And so may we live in this life and this forgiveness that you offer to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we praise God together in this place? 
So we're looking at three reasons to choose Jesus over religion. Ready to choose Jesus over religion? Jesus is so much better than religion. Let's look at the second ism. The second reason is this, is choose Jesus over mysticism because only Jesus sanctifies. So let's look at this, we, starting in uh, verse 19. It says this, it says, let no one disqualify you. Let no one kick you out. Let no one... Um, uh, push you aside. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. Some of you uh, may have the NIV. The NIV says false humility. It's pride in disguise. Why? It's based on uh, worship of angels go- and then going on in details about vision. Uh, do we believe that angels are real? Yes, we believe that angels are real, but angels were created by God to worship him, much like we were created by God to worship him. So we don't worship angels. We, when we worship God, we join with the angels and we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And then do we believe that God speaks through visions? Yes, God can speak through visions. He doesn't do so frequently, but he can speak through visions. But that doesn't mean that every dream you have in the middle of the night is a vision from God. It may just be a side effect from the tacos that you ate earlier that night. And so God doesn't primarily speak through visions. God primarily speaks through his word. And so if you want more of God in your life, then I encourage you to read God's word. And then notice what it says. So um, they're insisting on asceticism, which is uh, mysticism, really, uh, which is the worship of angels and visions, puffed up with any, without any reason. It was like a, it lacks substance. Why did it lack substance? because it wasn't holding fast, verse 19, wasn't holding fast to the head um, from whom the whole body is nourished. So it was a decapitated faith. I understand that's a graphic reference, but that's what it was. It was a headless faith that didn't have substance. So it wasn't being nourished, not knit together, and joints and ligaments, they grow uh, from a growth that is from God. And so uh, mysticism, what is mysticism? Let's get this definition on the board. Mysticism is Jesus plus religious experiences. So here's the definition. Mysticism is a spirituality that is based on feelings and emotional religious experiences. A foundational verse here at High Point Church is John chapter 4, verse 24. It says that God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we worship with emotion based on the truth that we know about Jesus from his word. And so when we gather together here on Sundays or as we are uh, living our own life, as we are worshiping, we are not just singing about God, but we are singing to God. That's why we don't sing with our hands in our pocket and we aren't stoic because we're not just worshiping with our lips and worshiping with our minds, but we're worshiping from our hearts. And because we're worshiping from our hearts, there should be an emotion that is there. And the emotion isn't this like tingly, like goosebumpy feeling. Sometimes you might feel that in worship. But the emotion is that of joy for who God is. It's the emotion of gratitude for what he has done. And so we don't worship an emotion that's important to understand. We worship God. But maybe you're here and you're like, I want more of God in my life. I desire that in my life. That's awesome. We all go through seasons, through days, through weeks, through months, where Christian life seems stale. Have you ever been there before where things were stale? Yeah, so if you're there, you're not alone. Maybe you're here today and you're in a season where you're just kind of going through the motion and it lacks emotion. It's awesome that you desire more of God's fullness in your life. Just guard yourself that you're not pursuing a mystical, emotional experience. Instead of holding out for a feeling, hold fast to the head, which is Jesus Christ. And so we choose Jesus over mysticism because only Jesus sanctifies. 
If we're going to experience growth, it comes from a growth that comes from God. And we see this here in the text. You can see on the screen. It's a growth that comes from God. And so there's an individualistic aspect to our faith. But let's not miss out on the community language that we see here in the passage. Notice all the references to the body. Uh, One of the most popular metaphors in scripture about the church is the body. And here we have it, the head, which is Jesus, and the whole body nourished and knit together and joints and ligaments. Do you see the community language that is there? If you're trying to live the Christian life without biblical community, is like trying to live life without oxygen. Much like you need oxygen to sustain you physically, you need biblical community to sustain you spiritually. And that's why we need each other. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need me. We need each other. And you can see that the growth that comes from God and that we are the body of Christ. That's why you can't say I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You can't say I love the head, but I don't love the body. I, 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 to, to love Jesus is to love the body. To love the body is to love Jesus. Now, are there some people that are hard? To love within the body? Yes. Are you hard to love it sometimes? Yes. I know that I am. But Jesus loves the church and he gave himself up for the church. That the church doesn't need more critics from within inside the church. The church needs more servants within the church. More servants that are willing to serve each other within the body. You see what happens when we argue about petty things? We injure ourselves, we injure others, we hinder the gospel from going forth, we hinder the reputation of God. When the body is divided, who bleeds? Jesus. Because Jesus is the body. We are the body of Christ. And so maybe you're here and you're like, I want more of God in my life. And that's awesome. Pursue God. Pursue Jesus. Pursue him individually. Pursue him in community. Be connected to the head. Be connected to the body. That's why we gather together on uh, Sunday mornings for worship. That's why we encourage you to read God's word on your own. We're doing a study of the book of Colossians together individually, and then we're doing it together in groups. And so we can discuss God's word. Are you in a growth group? Maybe you started coming to High Point just in this past year, and um, you, I encourage you to come and be a part of Discover High Point. It's not Discover High Point as an organization, but it's Discover how you can experience growing relationally and spiritually uh, here at High Point. That's coming up in two weeks. And so we choose Jesus over mysticism because only Jesus sanctifies. And then last we see this third uh, choice or third reason is choose Jesus over aestheticism because only Jesus satisfies. We're going to go real deep, real quick, starting in verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to its regulations? If you have a pen, underline that word, religious regulations. And then notice this, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, referring to the things as they perish as they were used. You see the aesthetics, they believed that everything material was evil and that you gained holiness by rejecting the things that were material. But the reality is God created everything and when God created everything, he said it is good, that it's good for our enjoyment. And according to human precepts, it was just their own human precepts and teachings. These have indeed have an appearance of wisdom kind of on the outside that appears to be wise But all it does is promote a self-made religion and asceticism, there's the word, and severity to the body. 
but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So why are all these rules and regulations, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Why are all these regulations of no value? Because they don't change the heart. And the heart is what needs to be changed. So what is aestheticism? Aestheticism is Jesus plus religious regulations. Here's a definition for asceticism on the screen. We're learning some things at church today. Asceticism is achieving holiness through self-denial of material things. You might be here saying, well, didn't Jesus say that we're to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him? Yes, but Jesus didn't say that we need to deny all material things as a way to gain holiness. The problem with asceticism is it takes away the freedom that Jesus wants us to have in him. And so Galatians chapter five, verse one, it says this, for freedom, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand therefore and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. You see, all these rules, all these regulations, it didn't have the power to change what really needed to change, and that was a change of the heart. But what Jesus does is that Jesus gives us a new heart. Jesus gives us desires. Gives, Jesus gives us a new freedom. So for freedom, you have been set free. Don't return then to the yoke of slavery. Well, what is freedom? Freedom isn't doing what you want. Freedom is doing what you ought. That Doing whatever you want doesn't lead to freedom. Think about this with me. Doing whatever you want leads to a lot of heartache and headaches. Doing whatever you want, it leads to regret and guilt and shame and foolishness. Doing whatever you want, it leads to being a slave to sin. True freedom True freedom isn't doing whatever you want. True freedom is doing what you were created for. And you can only experience that kind of freedom in Christ. And when you experience that freedom, then you are satisfied. And so choose Jesus over aestheticism. Why? Because only Jesus satisfies See, at the heart of the Christian faith, you got to understand this. I think it's so, many people misunderstand this. The heart of the Christian faith is not a bunch of rules and regulations. The heart of the Christian faith is freedom. And when we experience freedom, then we're satisfied. When we experience the fullness of Jesus in our life, then we are satisfied. When we've tasted Jesus, the real thing, the Coca-Cola classic, then we're satisfied. So let's do a quick review. The band is here. We're going to stand in a moment and sing. Legalism, what's legalism? It's Jesus plus religious rules. Mysticism is Jesus plus religious experiences. Aestheticism is Jesus plus religious regulations. But we don't want to choose religious systems. We want to choose Jesus. Well, why choose Jesus? We choose Jesus because only Jesus saves, because only Jesus sanctifies, because only Jesus satisfies. As you look at this list here, think about this. These are all blessings that Jesus wants to give you. What is the blessing that you need to receive today? For some of you, you already have received this today here in this moment, but some of you, you're still wrestling with it and you need to receive Jesus as your savior because Jesus saves. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I'm kind of apathetic in my faith. I want to grow in my faith. Stay connected to the head. Grow with a growth that comes from God. Only Jesus 
sanctifies. Maybe you've been living, trying to live in this so-called freedom, but it's only led to regret. It hasn't satisfied. So maybe for some of you, it's returning back to Jesus, to the freedom that you have in Jesus, to live what you were created for. Only Jesus satisfies. Let's stand and let's sing. Let's sing to this only Jesus that we worship.